I bring you greetings in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord in whose name we have gathered together this evening to worship him, to fellowship with one another and to meditate of his holy word. I want to really thank God that uh, the organizers of this program when I proposed the name for these meetings as Bible revival meetings instantly they accepted. There was uh, no dispute about it and uh, that gave me a confirmation that the word that the Lord has placed upon my heart is what is to be delivered uh, during these uh, four meetings that we will be having during this weekend. Now these meetings are called Bible Revival Meetings. Now that is based on the prayer of David uh, in one of his Psalms especially that comes very often in Psalm 119, O Lord revive me and then he says revive me according to your word. Now there are so many revivals that are talked about. Uh, but only a revival that is patterned after God's word will accomplish the purpose for which God has sent it. Otherwise those revivals will die out before they would do anything substantial for the kingdom of God. So David rightly prayed, uh, maybe he didn't have this doctrinal point in mind when he made that prayer, but I, I believe that as we live on this side of that particular uh, prayer, that our revivals that we are praying for, uh, this evening I had the privilege of meeting with a sister who was telling about her burden and the burden of several others to intercede for revival in St. Paul and Minneapolis. I really thank God for that. And it is very important when we talk about revival, we pray that, oh God, revive me, revive my family, revive my church, and revive the people who are associated, uh, who go by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ according to your word. And here uh, you have um, the subtitle for the meetings given as an opportunity for Christians of all churches in and around Minneapolis to understand, to learn the sound doctrine of God's word and to escape the floods of false doctrine. So you would obviously hear a lot of doctrinal teaching during these four days. I am not basically an evangelist, I am a Bible teacher. So it is necessary that all of you bring your Bibles when you come to the meetings. If you do not have a copy of your Bibles this evening, please share the Bibles of your neighbors. And if your neighbor also does not have a copy of the Bible, it is good to change your seats. And then it is also important that you put off your cell phones, do not even keep them in the vibration mode because that is the minimum we can do as a, as a reverential respect uh, for a God whose word we are meditating together. Now when we talk about doctrine, um, uh, there is an immediate reaction that comes in the minds of average Christians, why talk about doctrine? Let us talk about Christ. Now that uh, looks spiritual, but that is not scriptural. Uh, because uh, if you turn with me to 2 Timothy 3rd uh, chapter, I would uh, say the references only once in quotes of the message and uh, those of you who have the habit of taking down notes, you please uh, take down the notes and uh, because this will be helpful for you not only to review but also when you relate it to your friends. I always believe that 30 percent or 40 percent of any talk we understand when the talk is delivered or listened to and the other 30 percent we understand when you review it, we restudy it, uh, when we remunerate it. And the remaining 40 percent you understand when you share it with other people. This is what always happens. So it is necessary that we write down everything, uh, note down and then review and it is very helpful. Only then we can think of um, uh, 30 fold, 60 fold or 100 fold. Otherwise even before those seeds begin to take root, the fowls of the air, obviously referring to spirits of the evil world, will snatch the seeds away and they will not even take root live alone giving fruit. So this is a very basic uh, spiritual discipline that we need to understand. Now turn with me to 2 Timothy 3rd chapter, I will read to you verses 16 and 17. All scripture, all scripture, uh, no portion is exempted, no portion is excluded, all scripture, the whole Bible is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. It is profitable for what? You find uh, there are four things that are mentioned as the prophets of God's word. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. So here we have the fourfold profitability of God's word, and in that fourfold profitability is very interesting. That which comes first is doctrine. Doctrine. Now we all know, 
uh, often think that uh, if only today's church will be like the early church where the disciples uh, 120 quickly swelled up to 3,000 and 3,000 swelled up to 5,000 and 5,000 swelled up to a number that they were not able to count. They lost count. They said multitudes. If only that could happen. Now, there was a secret uh, for their um, explosive uh, phenomenal growth. If you turn with me to Acts of the Apostles, second chapter, uh, the secret is uh, very obvious there. Here was uh, Peter giving them a full sermon, full length sermon. And we read in verse 40, with many other words he testified and exhorted them. And you find in the next verse the response from the people. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And, you know, that's important. 3,000 souls were added to them. Now that's only the beginning. That's not the end. You don't stop there. And. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. There are again four things mentioned, and there again, that which comes first is doctrine. This is not accidental, beloved. I want you to understand. I can just take you through so many scripture passages. Because the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of God's word is what will ultimately keep us safe and solid and established when the winds of false doctrine or floods shall dash against the walls of the church, it will stand and it won't fall because it is deeply founded on the solid rock of God's word. Now this truth we should have in mind when we go into the subject proper of this day. So this is why we need to study doctrine and doctrine is not to be given uh, the secondary importance in the study and meditation of God's word whether it is pulpit preaching or pure meditation, it should be very prominent. Only when it is prominent, we would fulfill God's purposes in our lives. Now, the subject that I have today to share with you during the next 90 minutes uh, is a rather a delicate and a difficult subject, but it is a very necessary subject. I want to speak to you on deception. Deception. Now, I want to begin with a very important scripture text in Matthew's Gospel. Quickly turn to the scripture references. Uh, if you have a notebook and a Bible, maybe you can keep your notebook on your left lap and keep your Bible on the right if you are a left-hand writer or the other way about. Anyway, make it very convenient. And if you miss out on a single words, don't disturb your neighbor, lest both of you get disturbed. Now, Matthew 24, here we have the Lord Jesus Christ giving out the signs of the end times. Now look at um, the verse 3. Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, you know sometimes Jesus answered questions publicly, but when it is of a very, uh, very, very uh, paramount importance, especially to the church that it has to be passed on to generations, generally he talked to them in private. And the disciples also in course of time understood. To start with they asked questions in public, but in course of time, they knew which question to ask in public and which question to ask in private. So here we find the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things should be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I think there were three questions. Uh, I don't think Jesus gave the answer to these three questions in the chronological order, but he just mixed up the whole lot. So we would just use that word end time. So what will be the sign of the end time? Or what will be the sign of the last days? And what will be the sign of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which will be the closure of this church age? See what Jesus immediately answered. Now, the answer is given in the entire 24th and the 25th chapters. If you have your Bibles where um, the words of Christ are printed in red, you find the entire pages of uh, 24th and 25th chapters all red. But when Jesus gave such a long, lengthy, full answer, what must interest us is the first sentence that he gave. What will be the sign of the end time? The first sign, he says, in verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. So the very first thing that Jesus warned them against was deception. Even before he started to list out the signs, he said, take heed, let no one deceives you. 
And I want to just spend some time on this particular sentence because it, it's just pregnant with the exhortations for us. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. So he was addressing the uh, first line of disciples, right, who were with the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years, walked with him and walked with him and ate with him and, uh, uh, you know, they were just very close. So the possibility of the closest disciples of Jesus Christ getting deceived, take heed that no one deceives you. Now this was not only the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ, this was also the explicit warning of the Holy Spirit. For example, if you turn with me to 1 Timothy 4th chapter, uh, we look at words uh, uh, 1, 1 Timothy 4th chapter and words 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says, that word expressly means openly or apparently, directly, explicitly says, that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits. So what the Lord Jesus Christ spoke, here the Holy Spirit endorses, because we have the very important doctrine, the Holy Spirit does not speak anything by himself, Jesus himself said. The Spirit when he comes, he will not speak anything by himself. He will take from what I have said and he will remind it to you. It's a very important truth we need to understand. The Holy Spirit is God, but he doesn't speak by himself. He takes from what is Christ and he speaks. So Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. And here the Holy Spirit comes with his explicit endorsement. In the latter times, people will give heed to deceiving spirits. Not just deceiving spirit, but deceiving spirits. Obviously, there are many. Now, this was the constant worry of Apostle Paul whenever he was traveling, especially when he was uh, revisiting the congregations which he planted. Take, for example, 2 Corinthians 11th chapter. Now, all, most of these verses uh, I'm sure that you are quite familiar with, but when we put them all together in this context, you find it opens up altogether a new horizon for us of biblical understanding. 2 Corinthians 11th chapter and third verse. Now, about the Corinthian church, he says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Now, wherever we come across the word deceive, maybe in the course of this talk, you can underline that. As the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He says, somehow, mark that word. Satan has got various means that we need to understand. Now, if you are 80 years old, you are only, you have an experience of committing sin for only 80 years. But you know the devil, he knows a father or grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, beginning with the first parent. So his experience of tempting and deceiving started time immemorial. Think of his uh, millennia of experience in tempting and cheating and deceiving mankind. And he says, as the serpent deceived Eve, where was the deception? The deception was not in a gambling spot, it was not in a race course, it was not a cinema hall, it was in the Garden of Eden, where there was the literal presence of God, and where the humankind had not committed their first sin yet. Think of a situation like that. The first parents, the first couple who had not committed their first sin yet, in that garden, in that place, such a blissful, blessed presence of God, if a man or a woman could be deceived, we who are living in a sin-toxic world, the very atmosphere is sin-toxic, right? and bombarded with all sorts of temptations. What do you look? What do you hear? What do you see? What do you think? How easy it is for us to be tempted. And what was the temptation? That temptation was not a temptation to commit a grass sin. It was not a temptation to commit adultery. 
it was not a temptation to murder, it was not a temptation to steal, it was not for any other sin, it was a very simple temptation, but an awesome temptation. What was the temptation? A little bit of a deviation from God's word. Has God said? That is the whole thing. Has God said? So, it was, if it was for any heinous crime, I think the, 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 the first parents would have escaped. It was very simple, a little bit of an alteration. And now if you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, 24th chapter again. Now when you find time, please go through these two chapters. Tremendous importance for us living in the last days. If you look at 24 and 24, it is easy to remember. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, again the word deceive, if possible, even the, even the elect, even the elect, not the backsliders. Now that the word elect obviously does not very much include backsliders, it is even the elect who are just getting ready for the last step, the last leg, even they could be deceived. And that is why Paul would say, that you are bewitched, you are sedated and I want you to come out of this sedation. And that is why he is telling preachers and teachers of God's word, you need to teach them with all patience so that they will come out of the snare into which they have been trapped. Very strong words Paul has been using whenever he made a reference to these false doctrines and things which deceive God's people. <clears throat> this evening I want to point out to you seven vital areas of possible deception for God's people, those who are living in the last days. There are so many areas why you could be deceived, but as I was uh, browsing through the New Testament, I came across seven of them, solid seven. And then I made a study and it really warmed my heart and it warmed my spirit. And I just want to share that with you, beloved, this evening. My message this evening at some points might appear somewhat critical. But I don't, I don't want to be critical, but I want to be analytical. We need to analyze. We need to discern. God has not told us not to think. God did not tell us to remove our mind, but he said renew our mind. So the mind should be renewed so that it is given to more sane thinking. Think. So here also Paul says, lest your minds are corrupted. So when you fail to think, you are sure to be deceived. None of the things in spiritual world can be taken on face value. You need to think. You need to analyze. You need to probe into it. You need to ask questions. You can't simply take, take a coin and just uh, put it in your pocket. You need to really see whether it has got imprint on either side and they are, very, 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 they are right. Otherwise, that coin will not go. Think. So I was able to come across seven vital critical passages. I deliberately choose certain words, not just for verbosity's sake, but just to, uh, just to drive home the truth because that is important. I, I try my level best to just hammer these truths into your hearts this evening. The first area is in Colossians second chapter. Please turn to your Bibles, uh, never uh, go lazy to turn to your Bibles. It is nothing like looking into your Bibles to see for yourself whether things are so. Colossians second chapter, reading from verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Now, this is the introduction. He just uh, protects them. You know, prevention is always better than cure. So, he said, this I say, lest anyone should deceive you. What is the area of deception Paul was talking about? Though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, etc., etc. And he says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, and then he says in verse 8, 
Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Again, you know, deceit, cheating. According to the tradition of men and according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Because in Christ dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You know what uh, the, the, the subject is? You know, it's very, if you are a regular reader and a meditator of God's word, you can quickly grasp. Otherwise, it takes time. Now, he was talking about the supremacy of Christ. Because what was under attack in the Colossian situation as Paul was writing this epistle was the supremacy and the uniqueness of Christ came under attack. So that was a problem. So he was trying to say that as you have received Christ, you walk in him, rooted in him and established in him and he is the head, in him all the fullness is there and you are complete in him. Be careful that anyone uh, cheats you with uh, uh, the principles of this world. You know, today we are very much in danger of losing the vision of the supremacy of Christ. You know how? We sometimes get excited in religious experiences that our vision of Christ gets blurred. Can that happen? Yes. You go to Mount of Transfiguration, there is a vision, there is a voice. And there are two heavenly visitors. Very exciting. Nothing can be more exciting than the experience of these disciples at the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus was transfigured. In that excitement, in that religious excitement, you know what Peter said? Let's, he just brought Christ to the level of uh, Moses and Elijah. How do I say that he brought them to that level? Because he, he, he just offered, uh, he just presented and launched a project. Let's just put up three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, if that proposal had been right, what happened immediately after that would not be what is recorded for us in the Bible. It says, those two heavenly visitors were no more to be seen, only Jesus was there. And not only that, to confirm that a voice came from heaven saying, Hear him. He is my beloved son. It's not he is my beloved son. It is he is my beloved son. So even religious experiences can sometimes take our vision of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only the supremacy of Christ, but also the centrality of Christ. Now in this uh, passage that I read to you, verses 4 to 11, in verse 5 we read about Christ. And in verse 6, we read about Christ. And in verse 7, we read about Christ. And verse 8 and 9, you find Christ, 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 Christ comes again and again. Now, I would call this the Christocentricity of Christian faith. Christ, the center. He's not only supreme, but he is also the center. And what are the opposites? Look at verse 8. Philosophies traditions of men, principles of the world. What's the principles of the world? How to improve yourself. Self-improvement techniques. That's the principles of the world. What's the doctrine of Christ? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the difference? World of difference? How to improve yourself? Especially you people who are living in the western world, you need to be extremely careful. No, no, no. The word careful is a very light word. Extremely cautious. The principle of old is self-improvement. Lot of techniques, principles, philosophies, traditions. But there is something different. You are the branches, I am the wine, and without me you can do nothing. If you abide in me. You know, they are totally two different worlds. So when you go to Christian bookstores, you should be very careful when you pick up a book. There's a lot of Christless Christianity stuff that is there on the bookshelves of many Christian bookstores. Unless you keep your eyes wide open, you will get lost. 
growth should be into Christ, rooted in him, growing into him, established in him. Now, I would give you a homework, maybe homework, but you can start. Go through the epistles that we have in the New Testament, especially the epistles of Apostle Paul. There is one phrase that comes again and again than any other phrase, in Christ. In Christ. Just keep marking them on and then study them. Your heart will begin to dance within you. And most of the materials that are served as Christian materials to today, you will see that they are all rubbish. That is not the Bible. It's not the Bible. Now, we still have this old book in our hands. Revive me, Lord, according to your word. One of the best-seller books in the United States. That book is sold even in uh, some supermarkets. Very popular book. But you read through the entire book, you come across the name of Christ hardly five or six times, but most of the times, throughout the book, it's all God, 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 God. But which God? You know, it's very easy. God, God, God. I mean, it's a very unoffensive word. God. But that word Christ is missing. And that author of that bestseller was interviewed in the television. I don't know how many of you watched the television show. We watched it. Why is it that in your book, you being a pastor, uh, you're a Christian preacher, but the word Christ doesn't figure out much. It's all God, God, God. You know, this preacher answered, that's none of my business. I'm actually understating. I'm actually understating. Unless you keep your eyes and hearts and minds wide open and be alert and watchful. Before you know that you are deceived, you would have missed God's will by a million miles. That's why the warning that I'm serving you this evening. The centrality of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. Any doctrine, any practice, any experience, any program, any ministry that leaves out that vital New Testament doctrine of in Christ, beware. Don't have much to do with it. Don't play with it. Don't play with it. You can't keep coals of fire on your bosom and go unburnt. Better avoid it. These things are written lest we be deceived. The second area of deception I come across in book of Ephesians, fifth chapter. I'll read to you from verse 6 onwards to verse 11. Ephesians 5, 6 to 11. Let no one deceive you with the empty words. Again, that word deceive. Let no one deceive you with the empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And what's that he talks about? What's the deception that he's uh, referring to? Do not be partakers with them, because once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, and walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them or reprove them. Now this speaks about lifestyle. The earlier one that we talked about was concerning the supremacy or the centrality of Christ. But this particular passage speaks about our lifestyle, our behavior. Now you find here darkness and disobedience. Darkness and disobedience always go together. That's why the children of darkness are also called the children of disobedience in the Bible. The moment you disobey God, voluntarily and consciously, maybe you are not, uh, uh, you don't want to do it, but you are walking into darkness. It is as we keep on obeying the Lord, greater and greater light is shed before you. Sometimes, you know, we are only seeking for knowledge. I want to know more, I want to know more. But I always believe that why, what we Christians need these days is not more of light. We need more of obedience. 
to what has been already taught us, what has been already revealed to us. We all of us have a lot of arrears, a lot of arrears. So many things that the Lord has already taught us, but we have not obeyed them. And we want the Lord to tell us a little more. We want to hear one more sermon. We want some more revelations. More. God is not interested in uh, just investing his revelations on disobedient people. He wants us to obey him. As you obey, more and more light will be shed on your path. Now here we are talking about walk in light. Walk in light as children of light. Look at verse 9. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. You know, it's very good. Beautiful words. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's acceptable to the Lord. Beloved, once again, any doctrine, any experience, any program, any ministry, which does not increase and intensify your thirst and hunger, for holiness and godliness must be questioned. Shall I say that again? Any ministry, any program, any teaching, any experience that does, does not intensify your desire and thirst and hunger to be holier than what you are, to walk into greater paths and depths of righteousness, must be brought under scrutiny and question. That's what we read in 1 John 3rd chapter and verse 7. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. You know, there again the word deceive you. What is the deception that he talks about? He who practices righteousness is righteous just as Christ is righteous. A God is righteous. It is true that God has imputed righteousness upon us. We are made righteous in Christ. But what is our response to the potential righteousness? That should be practical righteousness. Just because we are clothed with the robe of righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that does not guarantee everything. Do not be deceived. Little children, do not be deceived. You may wonder why he uses the word little children. You know, many times he uses the word little children. By the time John was writing these epistles, he was 90 plus. So anybody in the congregation looked like little children. <laughs> Not that he was uh, taking Sunday school there. So little children, all youngsters, he's talking to them. Much juniors to him. Because he already has, to his credit, 60 or 70 years of solid walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he started following Christ as a very young person. So now it was 90 plus. The, actually, the epistles of John are the last written books of the Bible. Even though Revelation is there, the, John, the epistle is the last written book. So 90 plus. So he says, little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not be deceived. God imputes his righteousness on us. He gives us lots of blessings, etc. But your response should be that you should walk in righteousness as he is righteous. The Bible says, he who is holy, let him be holier still. He who is unholy is not to be holier still. He who is holy, let him be holier still. He who is made righteous by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, let him become practically righteous by walking in righteousness and holiness and godliness and things which are approved by God and acceptable to him. That's what exactly Paul wrote to Timothy also. There are so many verses, but just for the, for, because we have the constraint of time, I try to just limit to a few references only. But these are all pivotal texts. First Timothy 6th chapter, I look at the third words. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Put that together. Doctrine according to godliness. So any doctrine, any teaching should ultimately lead us to holiness. Suppose you keep listening to a preacher for one month, maybe four, four sermons or five sermons, 
or one year or maybe you are turning to your uh, television somebody coming there very often and then you are watching him what's the result of listening to that person that preacher is there an intensification of your desire to live holy to be more like jesus or don't worry everything is all right with you a kind of a a kind of being adjustable and a compromise making you feel very comfortable the bible says blessed are the pure in heart that word blessed can be translated also as happy happy are the holy happy are the holy people holy people are always happy people but happy people need not be holy people now in most of the uh, programs the, the 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 thrust is on excitement joy rejoice be happy everybody but you don't need to work up happiness if you live holy you will be happy happiness invariably is a by product of holiness show me one person who is not happy who is holy because that person is guilt free that person walks in the light that god sheds for him and that person constantly keeps himself submerged under the stream of immanuel's blood he is joyful that is true joy it is not excitement it is much much deeper than excitement the joy of the lord this is a day holy unto the lord the joy of the lord your strength holy joy we used to teach that uh, truth in our youth camps you know we tell our young people holy life is jolly life it's not the other way around happy are the holy people now how do we grow in holiness one of the basic disciplines that you should have in your life to grow in holiness is to subject yourself to frequent self examination frequent self examination there were times i'm talking about 20 years 30 years ago in so many magazines and so many programs in so many camps we will be given some handouts you know those handouts you know what are they self examination questionnaire 20 questions 30 questions and once those questionnaires are given you just go and kneel down before in the presence of god alone ask these questions open up the scripture passages and go through a time of cleansing this has almost become a forgotten art in today's christianity but i believe that old hymn still holds good take time to be holy we spend time for prayer we spend time for blessing us we spend time asking god to do this that so many things but what happened to that old time religion that will get itself shut in the prayer closet to seek the face of the lord that god would turn his searchlight upon us and cry out like david search me o god and know my heart today try me o savior know my thoughts i pray see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting what happened to it you know there is a strong shift from holiness to happiness the priority is totally changed i suggest that christians read through the sermon on the mount of the lord jesus christ at least once every 3 months because there we have practical righteousness there we have practical holiness you know another very favorite subject these days for preachers is kingdom kingdom of god again and again they use the word kingdom kingdom the choruses will talk about kingdom and uh, the, the messages they would just use the word kingdom but what is kingdom life live according to sermon on the mount that's kingdom life 
You read through the Sermon on the Mount so many times, Jesus uses the word kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. In no other sermon he used that word kingdom as often as he used in the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount in the 5th and the 6th and the 7th chapters of the book of Matthew, that's the Magna Carta of the kingdom of God. Read them again and again. That's kingdom life. It's there he said, seek first the kingdom of God. And there he said, blessed are the pure in heart. And there he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There is the kingdom of God. Even if the, to begin with, he uses the word kingdom. So you find the entire sermon, the long sermon, saturated with the theme of kingdom of God. And that's against the background of practical righteousness and holiness. It's good to study the Bible, even doctrinal study. That's why Paul said, doctrine according to godliness. Sometimes it's easy for us to just fill our heads with biblical knowledge. Looking at the mirror, because the word of God is the mirror. Looking at the mirror, but quickly forgetting what we have seen on the mirror. And that's why James, he rebuked his readers. Don't deceive yourselves. Turn with me to that passage. You know, th these are all, you know, I didn't put anything into the Bible this evening, but it's all in the Bible. So I'm just trying to bring out what we have uh, failed to notice. James first chapter, verses 22 and 23. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Read that. Deceiving yourself. There again that word. If you just read the word or hear the word, but you don't do the word, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, but he goes away immediately. He forgets what kind of man he was. What is it? You know, we just uh, stand before uh, the mirror and we try to do all, make up everything because we believe this is not right, that's not right, not symmetrical enough, not sharp enough, things like that. But when we go, we have the impression and imagination in our mind that we are the most beautiful person in the world. So we forget. We forget what we have seen in the mirror. That's what here uh, James was trying to say in a very, very practical example, illustration. When did you last uh, uh, four went a meal to search your heart before God? I'm told that uh, in the United States you are given only 15 days of leave. When did you apply for leave for a day to go on fasting for self-examination? Is it asking for too much? Now what happened to those holy practices? Applying for leave to get shut in the prayer closet, to open the Bible and find out why we have deviated from the ways of God and why we have displeased Him and why we have disobeyed Him. And going through a time of fresh cleansing, is it asking too much? When did you do it last? Yeah, we have no time, no time. You say, brother, what you are talking about self-examination? Even to just read a daily devotional, we don't have time. Too busy. Beloved, if you are too busy, you are too busy. It's not healthy. Decide tonight, lest you be deceived. Walk in practical righteousness. The third area of deception that we can look at is Galatians 6th chapter. Now I told you at the beginning of this message that all these references I have uh, picked up for deception from the uh, New Testament. Because that is very much applicable to us as uh, the New Testament church people. Galatians chapter 6 <clears throat> and verse 3. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. When anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know what this refers to? This refers to self-exaltation. This refers to self-promotion or self-projection. 
the apostles never ever projected themselves beloved friends living in this western world beware of religious stardom once again beware of religious stardom superstar turn with me to second corinthians third chapter then you understand what i am talking about second corinthians third chapter verse 1 Do we begin again to commend ourselves, to project ourselves, to exalt ourselves, or do we need uh, some other epistles of recommendation to you, or letters of recommendation from you? We don't need. We don't need to commend ourselves. We need to. We don't need to project ourselves. What do we do? Fourth chapter. Read verses two and five. We have renounced the hidden things of shame. not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of god deceitfully underline that word deceitfully not handling the word of god deceitfully how do we handle the word of god deceitfully by commending our own selves we don't do it but we walk in the sight of god and what do we talk about ourselves what's why we do not preach ourselves but christ jesus the lord but how do we present ourselves introduce ourselves your servants for jesus sake servanthood not stardom servanthood not primarily interested in putting your hand on somebody's head but bending down to wash somebody's feet it's totally true different thing now today when he when he said ministry but in jesus time ministry was not this the ministry was just there you see the difference the shift it's a very subtle twist very subtle but unless you have got a spiritual discernment you won't be able to find that out that's what i'm trying to say all these passages speak of the same thing if you are in the ministry of god's word whatever kind of ministry you are doing i'm sure there are some people who are actively in the ministry some sort of ministry may not be full time up beware of exalting yourself you know hero worship is so common in religious circles once it was common only in the cinema world movie world and in politics but today if you want to know the definition of hero worship go to christian ministries so much of hero worship You know what happens when you start hero worshiping a preacher? Without your realization, you get manipulated, and you get into some kind of spiritual blindness. Look at Second Corinthians again, eleventh chapter, verses nineteen and twenty. You put up with fools gladly, <laughs> since you yourself think that you are wise. you put up with if someone brings you into bondage manipulation if someone devours you he just manipulates you if one takes from you if one exalts himself usually self exalting preachers will manipulate their followers you know self exaltation is a demonic in nature a very famous passage book of isaiah 14th chapter <clears throat> isaiah 14th chapter verses 12 to 14 <clears throat> turn to the references don't grow tired isaiah 14 12 to 14 <clears throat> how are you fallen from heaven o lucifer son of the morning how you are cut down to the ground you who weaken the nations for you have said in your heart i will ascend into heaven number 1 I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number five, I will be like the most high. You know, I, 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 I will exalt my self-exaltation. This is demonic in nature. 
the first temptation was nothing but the reflection of the satanic character. What did he tell the first parents or what did he tell Eve? In the day that you will eat of that fruit, you shall be like gods. You know, Satan cannot just uh, change his nature. Even on the first temptation, his total imprint was there. You shall be like gods. And his character is always the same. When you come down to the time of Antichrist, the Antichrist will exalt himself above everything that is in the name of God, sitting in the temple of God. Now, I don't need to go into the eschatological aspect of it, but you know that. But you know from beginning to end, it is always self-exaltation. Now, why do I make a reference to it? That is a doctrine that is very prevalent in the charismatic circles that believers are small gods. I don't know whether you ever heard this blasphemy. If you have not heard it, praise the Lord for that. Believers are said to be small gods. I won't tell the name of those preachers, many preachers, many, many popular preachers, they have that doctrine. You are a small God. You know why they just base their argument, their argument in the book of uh, Psalms chapter 82. For some of you, what I say may not be very relevant, but just be forewarned. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. It will be helpful at the right time. The Holy Spirit will remind you of the scripture passages. Psalm 82, uh, look at verse 6. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Taking this particular text, there are books and sermons which teach God's people that they are small gods. But here, it's only the translation problem that the word God simply means rulers, judges. How do I say that? Look at the third words. You should always look at the context. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. So here, God was referring to the civil leaders of the time. The leaders were the representatives of God's discipline. So they were, in that sense, they were called God. That means they were representative of God's law. Otherwise, look at the seventh words. You shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. <laughs> the gods don't die, no? You die like men. So it simply means that word God simply means that you are the rulers. And even today, you know, Paul wrote to the Roman church that uh, obey all civil authorities because he is a servant of God. He is there in the place of God to execute judgment and righteousness. So that's the simple meaning of it. But this verse is taken and it's stretched too much to tell some believers, so you are a small God. Don't think small about yourself. You are a God. We are not small gods. We are the children of a great God. Amen? I believe that. That's still my theology. I am not a small God. I am one of the children of the great, awesome, mighty God. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 8th chapter. Oh, these are scripture passages which will help us to throw away the scales of our eyes. 1 Corinthians 8th chapter verses 5 and 6. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, there are many gods and many lords. It is only one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, through whom we live. I just want you to just recollect a very interesting incident that happened in the missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. They went to Lystra, and there was a man who was a cripple. 
By the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they performed a miracle upon that cripple. <laughs> Immediately the people in Lystra, you know what they said? Oh, gods have come in our midst. And what did they do? They brought a lot of garlands. And they brought some animals to be sacrificed. If it had been a modern preacher, you know, these days in some gospel conventions and campaigns, there is an organized garlanding. You know what is an organized garlanding? The organizers of the program itself buy garlands and give it to dignitaries to garland the preacher. You know where we have gone? You know where we have gone? They brought garlands and oxen and everything, but what did the apostles do? I don't want to demonstrate it. You know what they did? They tore their clothes. And they ran away screaming. You know what they said? Why are you doing these vain things? Let us repent to the living God. I want you to turn to the passage when you get back home. That is in the 14th chapter of Acts of the Apostles. Very dramatic presentation. Very dramatic presentation. Why do you do these vain things? We are simply men. Why do you want to put us on a different pedestal? We have nothing good in us apart from what God has given us. Let us turn to the living God. You know, they just bring that word living God against the dead traditions. That's why that word living God comes there. Vain things they were referring to. You know what is the biblical teaching? When you look at the stars and the firmament and your handiwork, what is man that you are mindful of him? Amen? That's the right doctrine. What is man? He's less than nothing. David was right when he said, Oh God, you remember that we are just dust. Everybody say that. Just dust. Say that. Just dust. That's the right theology. We are just dust. Not just nothing. We are less than nothing. Nothing good in us. And Paul once came so vehemently, he said, what is that you have that is of your own? Everything that you have is what you have received from God. If you have received everything from God, how is it that you are boasting as if it is yours? Beloved, we are not owners of anything. We are simply users of, of what God has given us. Self-deception is self-promotion, self-projection. There are lots of young people sitting here. I would like to repeat what Apostle Peter said. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time. Hallelujah. That's the truth. Humble yourself. You don't try to just climb up and grab. I'm so and so. I want to just improve myself. No, you cannot. You cannot. All of righteousness and all of so-called plus, plus, plus things are just filthy racks before God. What you need is not an improvement. What you need is a replacement. We can't improve ourselves. No, not at all. Just as I am. Just as I am. Without a plea. Praise God for that beautiful hymn which has brought perhaps maximum number of people to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why for about 40, 50 years in every one of the Billy Graham crusades all over the world, that was the hymn that was sung. Just as I am without a plea. Beware of projecting yourself and beware of religious stardom preachers who would manipulate you
by bringing you under the slavery of hero worshipping themselves to their own advantage. What is man that you are mindful of him, O oh God? The fourth reference is in 1 Thessalonians, second chapter. The fourth reference to deception is 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. I will read from verses 3 to 5. Our exhortation did not come from deceit. I learned that word deceit. Our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, nor was it in guile. For as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Neither at any time did we use flattening words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. So here what uh, Paul is referring to in the area of deceit or deception is covetousness. And that covetousness is not the general covetousness of God's people. It is covetousness of God's servants. It is covetousness of those who are on the pulpit with the ministry of God's word. Money-minded preachers let me thunder that statement. Money-minded preachers will invariably lead God's people into deception. That's why the Bible warns so often against covetousness and love of money on the pulpit. We all know about the book of Romans. It's a textbook on that great doctrine of justification by faith, right? That's the book that was used by Martin Luther during the time of Reformation. Essentially, the book of Romans is a doctrinal book. The main portion of the book of Romans, maybe, maybe up to 12th or 13th chapters, you find, it's all full of doctrine, the law, grace, and how we are made new in Christ, and so on and so forth. It's, very, it's a rich doctrinal book. And as you move out from the 12 chapters, before you come to the 16th chapter, you find our practical exhortation, do this, do that. And as you come to the end of that big doctrinal treatise, it's the names of so many people, greet that person, greet that person, greet that person. That person was so helpful in the ministry, and that person has been so, so much of a great comfort, etc., etc. He makes that episode very personal. And he almost finished up with that episode. But he suddenly realized, having written at length about doctrine, and having given so many practical exhortations, and having referred to so many personal greetings, he suddenly realized he has to still warn God's people about this deception. Turn with me to the book of Romans, 16th chapter. You know, when you read something from the Bible, you should uh, see where it is written, why it is written so late. You know, look at the 16th chapter of Romans. From verse 1, he talks about uh, uh, Phoebe, our sister, and then in the word, third verse, Priscilla and Aquila, and then in third verse, sixth verse, Mary, seventh verse, Junia, and then Amphilias and Urban, you know, lots of names. So one wonders why all these names should find a place in a doctrinal episode. Doctrine has to be ultimately very personal. And you find in verse 16, greet one another with a holy case, the churches of Christ greet you. I think you could have finished with that. Then he starts all over again. Now I urge you, brothers, urge you. You know, a compelling uh, statement is giving. Now I urge you, brothers, not those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learnt and avoid them. Who are those people that you should be very careful about? He defines them in the next word. Those who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own, their own belly. You know, you're all from India, so I can give another word for belly. Madhya Pradesh. <laughs> their own belly, ultimately. 
and by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple under and then the word deceive. You know, having written so much about doctrine and personal greetings and saying greet one another with the holy kiss, the churches of Christ greet you, you could have stopped there. Suddenly he realized, this is what we call inspiration. It came up to him. It was not something which he wrote and he edited and gave it to a journalist and put it to, and gave this a new coinage of words. No, no, no such thing. It's the inspiration of God. So God told Paul, no, you please warn these people. No, I urge you. No. At this point of time, I urge you, brothers. Beware of those who serve their own belly. You know, there are two types of preachers, two types of preachers in this world. You know what they are? One is those who follow Pauline pattern and the others are those who are money minded. There is no third group. Is that so? Of course, yes. Come with me to book of Philippians. Uh, look at the third chapter, then you will understand. This is what Paul was writing with the tears. He was not throwing stones at anybody. He was not against anybody, but he was for something. Philippians third chapter, 17th verse. Every one of you look at that. I think we also should join Apostle Paul in weeping and crying. Brothers, join in following my example. And note those who walk according to my example and have us, apostles, as a pattern. Why I say that? Many walk of whom I have told you often. And now I tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Who are those enemies? Whose end is destruction, whose God is there. God is there? Belly. What do they do? They set their mind on earthly things. All the time talking about prosperity, health, wealth, all this. This is what always occupies them. They set their mind on earthly things. Their God is their belly. They are not the enemies of Christ. Follow me carefully. They are not the enemies of Christ. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They will have the Bibles in their hands. They will sprinkle their sermons with some scripture texts from here and there. They will also mention the name of Christ. They are not the enemies of Christ. But they are the enemies of the cross. There is a difference. This is how you should study the Bible. That cross, that suffering, that sacrifice, that letting it go, that shame, that living without, that concept will not be there. It is belly. You have three blessings. What I will get on this earth? What I will get today? Sorry, sir, that's not Bible. Paul would stand up in a congregation and he would say, our citizenship is in heaven. We are here on a temporary visa. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are eagerly awaiting our Savior to come from that heaven. For what? Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body, lowly body, sick body, weak body, frail body, who will transform this lowly body to be conformed to his glorious body. We are just looking for that. Today we may be sick, we may be healed, we may not be healed, no, that is immaterial. We are looking for that day when he would come from heaven and transform this lowly mortal body 
into his glorious body. So today we are not going to mind on these things mainly. They are secondary. Goodness and mercy shall follow us. We will not follow them. Are you with me? Goodness and mercy shall follow me. See, there is a twist. That is what I say. You do not go after them. Let them come after you. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these mundane things which the pagans and Gentiles are seeking after, concentrating, they are appendix. They are appendix. How do you say that appendix? Added unto you. Anything that is added is an appendix, isn't it? I think that is how I understand that word, appendix. If, if you can cut it off. It is not necessary. It is not an appendix. These things are added to you. But primary, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Maybe I am shaking some of you tonight, do not worry. Anything that can be shaken must be shaken, so that only that which cannot be shaken will remain. Beware of covetousness. How do you know that a preacher or a ministry is money minded or not? Very simple. This is my formula. Listen to three of his sermons, attend three of his meetings, read three of his messages, then you will know whether he is money minded or not. Very simple. But for some people, even one message is enough. But I try to give some allowance. Listen to three of his sermons and read three of his sermons and attend three of his meetings and read three of his magazine issues, then you will know whether he is money minded or not. Do not go ask others. You will know. You, you ought to know. Shall give you a simple clue? The less a preacher speaks about money, generally he is more dependable. Beware of pressurized, seductive appeals for contributions on money over the television. Do not be duped, do not be trapped. Paul very clearly said, we did not deceive anybody. We are not using it as a cloak of covetousness. No. We are not trying to cover up and play a hypocrite. No. We do not want it. Because we know how to abound and we know how to be abased also. We know. If God gives us money, we know how to use it. If God does not give us money, we will just go on fasting, praying. We will become stronger. No problem. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, sometimes we take that words out of context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does it mean? I can live within my budget without borrowing money. That is what it means. Simple. That is the interpretation. That is the context. I know how to abound and I know how to be abased. In all things, I have learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Simple. So beware of covetousness. Especially in charismatic ministries, you should be very careful. Why do I say that? Jesus said, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, amen. He did not say that. Giving out the exercising of the gifts of the spirit, he added one more. Freely you have received. Freely. Why should he say that when talking about the charismatic gifts? Because they are attaching a price tag to healing and blessing ministries is always there. That risk is always there. So Jesus predicted it even in his day. Heal, cleanse, do this, that, all that. 
after you finish you come back don't wait freely you have received freely don't attach even indirectly don't attach a pride tag for any of your ministries for any of the things that you do go to god's people beloved so much of erosion of christian values and biblical values in most of our ministries that's why we need to join paul and weep people are talking about laughing revival i think what revival we need is a weeping revival we need to weep and cry fifthly the fifth reference to deception book of galatians look at the sixth chapter galatians chapter 6 i'll read to you from verse 6 Galatians, I'm sorry, yeah, Galatians 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. Underline that word deceived again. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let's not grow tired in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So this refers to generosity, charity. To whom should we show charity? In the sixth words, it says to that person who teaches you God's word, to those who teach God's word to you. And then in uh, verse 10, it says, let's go to those who are of the household of faith, that to believers. And you don't stop your circle there, go still expanding. Tenth words, let us go do good to all. Our charity and our hand of help should be extended to those who preach the word of God to us. That's the first circle. And second circle to believers, those of the household of faith. And third circle to embrace all the people. How about they are all not Christians? Remember, <laughs> our Father in heaven, He makes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He makes His rain to shower both on the good and the bad. And then Jesus said, just as your father in heaven is perfect, you also be perfect. So we talk about perfection, but actually that word perfection came from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time in the context of blessing people, just loving people, not trying to limit it to our own brotherhood. If you greet your own brothers only, what extra do you do? That's not perfection. That's minimum. But if you love those who hate you, who abuse you and who don't become part of you because your father in heaven every morning when he makes the sun to rise he doesn't discriminate between the good and the bad and when the rain showers it's not between the good and the evil on all of them and be like your father in heaven how about charity now some time ago I wrote an article titled Christianity is charity some preachers became very wild with me. How can you say Christianity is charity? I said, I said Christianity is charity. I did not say charity is Christianity. Oh. Christianity is charity. You don't see any exercise, any experience of Christianity apart from charity. Take for example, one very interesting passage, book of Hebrews. Look at the 13th chapter. Now, it may come as a surprise to you, but it is there in your Bibles. Book of Hebrews, 13th chapter, 15th verse. By him let us continuously offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Praise and worship. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. It goes to verse 16. But, 
I am sure it is all in all your Bibles. Anyone has got NIV? The word but is there? Is there? Is there. But. Why the word but comes there? But. Do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Praise and worship, hallelujah, excitement, wonderful musical instruments. In that excitement, you forget those people who are in need to whom you have to stretch a hand of help. You forget. In other words, you become too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. You know that possibility, you understand? That's why it says, but keep on continuously worshipping God, praising God, that's all very good. But don't just keep on flying like that, come down. See, I like that verse. God, do you know what he says? Heaven is my throne, I sit there. But I keep my feet on the ground. Did he say that? Heaven is my throne, earth is my so God also keeps the feet here only. So, we, we fly all right, but land. You have to come there. Otherwise, what will happen? There is a man who is wounded, almost half dead. You are a priest. You bypass him. Why? You are going for praise and worship. Then comes the Levite. He also bypasses. Why does he bypass? After praise and worship, there is collection. This man has to count it. Both of them bypassed. You understand? Then a dog came. Did the dog come? Yes. Samaritans will be called by Jews as dogs. A dog came. Beloved, I want to come to this kind of practical Christianity, otherwise it is all vague and vain. It is a vapor. Give your praises continuously to God, that is good, but forget not to do good and to share. Because with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Sixthly, the sixth reference we have is in 2 Timothy, third, third, third chapter. Just take another few minutes, 2 Timothy, third chapter, verses 13 to 17. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, you know, either way. They not only deceive others, in the process of deceiving others, they are also deceived. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learnt and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learnt them, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. They are able to make you wise for salvation through faith. And he says, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, he starts with childhood and he goes to manhood. Are you able to see the full spectrum? Childhood to manhood opens up. It, 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 it opens up to the full spectrum. What? The Bible. The word of God. Saturating ourselves with the word of God. And it starts with salvation because he says, the, from childhood you have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation and when he comes to the 17th verse he ends up the man of God may be equipped for every good work service, salvation to service, youthhood childhood to manhood you know it opens up the full spectrum it is all concentration of the word of God here is a question how much time beloved you spend time with the meditation of God's word every day. If every day because of your busy schedule you are not able to do it, are you catching it up by weekends, clearing your arrears? With all our gadgets and facilities and whatnot, 
we ought to spend more time with the word of God on a daily basis compared to our counterparts in India. If not, something is radically wrong with us. God has given us so many gadgets. God has given us so many things which can quickly get the job done for us. With all that, we have an excuse, a lame excuse. We don't have enough time to meditate God's word. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand and embarrass you, but please answer this question in your heart. How many of you, on an average, spend at least an hour with God for unhurried meditation of God's word on a daily basis? Is it asking for too much? Is it asking for too much? How much time we spend for our physical food? How much time? Breakfast, lunch, dinner. And even after dinner, we pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> our problem is not uh, starving. Our problem is uh, overeating. Most of our problem. Now, that was my problem. That's why I had a bypass surgery 12 years ago. Eating everything on the face of the earth. And how much time we spend to earn bread, buy bread, cook bread, that's another thing. Earn bread. But how much time for the soul? Jesus said, man shall not live by. Beloved, if you are not spending enough time in the word of God, it's not that you are not growing. It simply says you are not living. Man shall not live. Growth comes next. I am talking about just living, being alive. Just to be alive, you need to take a good intake of God's word. This is called Bible revival meetings. If as a result of this three or four day program, those of you who have gathered here and those of you, those of those who would be listening to these messages as you will be sharing it with them, would come to this discipline of spending at least one hour with the meditation of God's word on a daily basis, that only will be said that the purpose of this program is fulfilled, not otherwise. Otherwise, it is another program only. I did not come here to make these meetings another program. I have come with a prayer that this program will become an event in your Christian life. Seventhly and lastly, we will get back to where we started. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Read verses 3, 4, 5. In the third chapter, they talk, they asked about what will be the end of the, what will be the sign of the end time. And fourth chapter, he uses the word, take heed that no one deceives you. And again, in the eleventh verse, he says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Again, deceive many. Not just deceive a few people, but deceive many. Many will deceive and many will be deceived. And come to verses 23 to 25. If anyone says to you, look, here is Christ or there, don't believe it. False Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. See, we have not even seen ordinary signs. Have you ever seen uh, water turning into wine? Have you ever seen that? I have not seen that. I only read it and I believed it. I have not seen that. But great signs they will show. Great wonders, not ordinary wonders, great wonders. If you are not solidly founded on God's word, you will fall flat. Sign wonders. If God is not there, how can this man do these miracles? That is not Bible doctrine. That is Nicodemus doctrine. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, you are a teacher from God. If God is not with you, no man can do these miracles that you do. You think that is a right statement? That is not a right statement. That is why Jesus in answer he said, he did not say, thank you very much. What a wonderful compliment. What a wonderful revelation. He did not say that. Rather, he said, hi, you must be born again. Because your mind has to change. You don't understand. Me. So in answer, Jesus said, you must be born again. So that's not a right statement. If somebody does miracle, that doesn't prove anything. We have more miracles in the non-Christian camps than in the Christian camps. I don't know whether you are aware of it. So miracles don't prove anything. 
So great wonders and great signs will happen. And says they will deceive if possible even the elect. I like the 25th words. I want to just worship my God for the 25th word. See, I have told you beforehand. That's what I, I said in the beginning. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Prevention is better than cure. Now what is Jesus trying to say here? You know, people will say, here it is, there it is, it's happening, come here and date setting. You know how many date setting has been there in the church history? Somebody said that Y2K, you know, the 2000. Oh, Christ, it's going to come. This time, that time. God has not called us for time setting. He has called us for goal setting. What is that goal? Beginning with Jerusalem. And all Judea and Samaria take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Jesus, is it that this time that he will restore the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 7. Jesus said, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has set, set in his authority. You shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and go and witness for me. That hour, even the Son of God does not know, only the Father knows. That he has kept. I am very happy that God has not revealed it to us when Jesus would come back. You know why? If only God has revealed it to us when Jesus would come back, none of us will be ready. Because if he had to come at 12 o'clock, till 9 o'clock we will be drilling. And then, oh no, another three hours is there. And you know the story. That's why he wants to come as a thief, so that we really will. Also, that's why he has not told us when he's returned. So beware of any such predictions and date setting and all sorts of, oh, this is a new revelation that has come to me, beloved. With the revelation of the Bible, there is Amen. It is no more new revelation. It is an understanding of that revelation which has already come. God who spoke at sundry times through prophets in various ways, in these last days, has spoken to us through his son. Now, I have tried to put so many things together tonight. I hope I have not confused you, but I have warned you. And it will be necessary for you to go through these passages again and again. And in conclusion, I just wanted to say some of the uh, signs of deception. Quickly, I will read them from my notes. You just keep listening to it, obviously. They are recording it, so you can later on just uh, play them. How do you know that a person is uh, deceived? Number one, the deceived person begins to think that he is unique. He feels he has received a revelation which no one else has got. Number two, the deceived person is more and more interested in the spoken word rather than the written word. He embraces extra biblical revelations as a new thing from God. He crosses the biblical boundaries. He shows unusual interest in personal prophecies. The third sign of deception, he is overexcited about dreams and visions and voices and spectacular and physical manifestations. God does give, give dreams, God does give visions, but he is overexcited about them. He is overoccupied with them. He keeps hunting for novelties. Number four, he becomes an eccentric. He stresses one doctrine or experience at the cost of the rest. He does not realize that it is a distorted version of the scriptures. Number five, he does not seek counsel from seasoned teachers. He does not subject himself to mature leaders. 
he thinks that he gets everything directly from heaven. Number six, very dangerous, he excuses certain sins in his life by explaining them away. He is usually hard on others, but he is very soft on himself. Number seven, he develops an unusual interest in the hidden and the secret things under the pretext of searching the scriptures deeply. God has said that secret things belong to me, only what is revealed is for you to obey. And eight, his practical interest in missions and evangelism slowly dies off. Ninth, he does not accept criticism objectively. If anybody criticizes him and says, no, what you are doing is not right, he gets back home and he says things, I am persecuted for the sake of the truth. <laughs> you know, that is a deception. And tenthly and lastly, very, very dangerous, the deceived man does not know that he is deceived. It is a very sad thing, is not it? That is real deception. If I know that I am deceived, I am coming out of it. The deceived man does not realize that he is deceived. He is blinded by successes and he is blinded by the answers to his prayers. If I am wrong, how does God bless me? <laughs> that is his question. He does not realize that we have a generous God. Shall we all stand up in the presence of God to commit ourselves to the written word of God and the total authority of the scriptures? Close our eyes, remind ourselves of the words of Jesus to the first set of disciples. See, I have told all these things to you beforehand. We will ask the Lord to forgive us our sinful neglect of daily unhurried Bible meditation. Time for everything but for the Bible. The Bible is a light to our path and that is the lamp to our feet. Without spending solid sufficient time with God's word we are sure to be deceived. Before we realize we are deceived, we would have deceived long, long ago. And the saddest part of deception is we will not know that we are deceived. It is a snare. It is a seduction. God in his love and mercy has forewarned us. Let us take these words quite seriously and not deceive ourselves by just being hearers only. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your blessed presence that was in our midst because we gathered in the name of your dear Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for whatever we learned from your word this evening under the subject of deception. If we have been deceived in any area of our lives, we pray, O God, that this message will enable us to bring us out, to deliver us from the deception, snatch us away from the clutches of the evil one and keep us on the right track. So, Lord, we walk in your ways and we have the witness of your spirit in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for this gathering. Thank you for the attentiveness with which we could listen to your word because of the thirst and hunger that you have given us for your word. Oh, God, we join David the psalmist to pray. Oh, Lord, revive us according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray.